Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Williams, and I'm one of the faculty organizers, or one of the faculty, um, um, I guess you could say, leaders of, of the uh, guitar sessions. And um, today, I'm very pleased to um, present um, one of our uh, very popular faculty members. Colin has been a faculty member on the guitar department at Berkeley for seven years. And uh, many years, a good few years ago, he was a guitar, uh, guitar student here as well. Um, he, he has quite an impressive resume that he's put together um, over the last uh, decade or so, whatever it is. He's got more than 150 re recording credits to his name. He's been out there playing uh, with, uh, with artists such as Kurt Elling, and, uh, and he's done gigs with the Backstreet Boys, and there's so many, uh, uh, such a big list of performers that he's worked with and everything. I don't even want to uh, take you there right now. But he has a great website. Uh, you can check his uh, stuff out, and I know that you're going to learn a lot today by what uh, uh, Colin has to say. He's a very versatile player, uh, got tons of chops in rock and jazz and other styles, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, uh, David Davidson, too, and the thing that they're doing together. So without any further ado, please put your hands together for Colin Sapp. Thanks, Mike. And Mike's also an incredible faculty member. He was one of the first teachers I ever had here as a student. Um, so it was a really uh, cool moment to, uh, to actually teach in the same room that I, like my first classroom as a uh, professor here was the first classroom that I had as a student, which was really trippy. Let me introduce my esteemed guest uh, to your right. Um, after graduating cum laude from Berkeley in 2008, David Davidson went on to become one of the most highly acclaimed metal guitarists of his generation. He is the lead singer and guitarist of Revocation and has earned recognition among fans, guitar magazines, and music websites for his unique approach of blending rock, heavy metal, blues, and jazz into technical progressive metal compositions. In 2011, Metal Sucks, metal Sucks wrote, all heavy metal guitar playing up until now has been leading up to the existence of David Davidson. David Davidson is modern metal guitar. Revocation's 2016 album, Great Is Our Sin, debuted number one on the Billboard Top New Artist charts. Davidson is currently recording the first full-length album for a side project, Gargoyle, and teaches privately in between world tours. He is endorsed by Jackson Guitars, EVH Amplification, DiMarzio Pickups, and Diodario Strings. Please give it up for David Davidson. <clears throat> so we're gonna do kind of a, a mix of things today. We're gonna do a lot of chatting. We're gonna do a lot of playing. Um, we'll start with a little bit of uh, catching up. Dave. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Colin. What's How's it going, feel like guys? to be back at uh, your old stomping grounds? You were here. Yeah, yeah. I went to uh, college at Berkeley. Had an excellent experience here. Studied with just so many great guitar players that really shaped me into the guitar player I am today. Um, just want to give a shout out to a couple great professors. Uh, you know, Bruce Saunders, uh, Joe Stump, Brett Wilmot, uh, John Damian, uh, John Baboyan. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. There's so much uh, raw talent here, and I got to really take advantage of that. Absolutely. Um, so it's been a big year for you. Um, catch us up on uh, what's been going on over the last 12 or so months. Sure. Yeah. Um, our new record, The Outer Ones, came out uh, last fall. We're getting ready to do a North American tour, U.S. and Canada. Um, coming up uh, September, October. So I'm excited for that. Uh, I've got a new band called Gargoyle that uh, we're in the process of recording our full length. So that should be out sometime probably next year, I would say, maybe like springtime next year, maybe, maybe wintertime. And I've uh, just been working with uh, different companies, doing some different signature products. Um, I got like a new pedal coming out with uh, Dunnable Guitars. That Which she be, has here to today. Here. Yep. Yeah. Sounds really good. <laughs> it does. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just staying busy teaching, just all things music related, so. Awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. What about yourself, Colin? What have you been up to? Um, a lot of collaborations lately. Uh, I've, I've been playing with Billy Gilman from The Voice. He's got a new album coming out um, 
and Billboard had us do like a, an acoustic uh, in studio thing. So that video is going to drop whenever he's about to release his record. We'll we'll be putting that out as a teaser. Um, been recording a lot of original tunes with uh, people that I've wanted to connect with over the years, and um, I've been developing a rhythm game as an app with a designer for rhythmic subdivisions. So we're in the prototyping phase of that. Uh, I filmed some new videos for my YouTube series, Inside Out Guitar, um, and um, some videos with uh, various folks that um, I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then there's been some uh, companies that have helped us out uh, with uh, some gear stuff. So you mentioned Dunnable, uh, EVH, and he's got a signature Jackson guitar that'll be, uh, he'll be bringing that out. That's available. Uh, at, Worldwide, right? Like, there's like two f different models of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You can get that. Um, I think the custom shop run is already sold out, but you can get the Pro Series model. Oh, um, sick. You know, through order. Or, like, I think certain guitar centers have it, something like that. Right on. Yep. And then Friedman, I want to give a shout out to Friedman Amplification. They um, provided this amp uh, for today and uh, one of their BEOD Deluxe pedals. And so uh, I just want to thank them and GHS Strings. Um, and Strymon Engineering uh, for their pedals. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much, that, that's that, right? There's no one else, do, do we need to thank anyone else? Oh, Diodario. Yeah. 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 Thank we, you for the strings. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all you guys for coming out. Yeah. You know? You guys having a good week so far? <laughs> pa page one. Sick. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about our backgrounds because um, we both came from like a rock metal background and then we both found jazz and Berkeley was part of that um, thing. Uh, for, for me, it was, uh, I started with like, kind of like the classic thrash stuff in the 80s, so like the Metallica, um, Megadeth, uh, anthrax, um, Death Angel, uh, not Death Angel. Uh, that was I was a little young. I was little, Ozzy, um, but we're talking. I was like I was like seven or eight years old when I was starting to listen to this stuff because um, I had an older brother and he had like an older like step brother and like they were playing like Twisted Sister. I remember it, Quiet Riot, and then we got into like Blizzard of Oz territory real quick. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Um, and then I got a guitar when I was nine. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of that until I was in my late teens. And then my older brother started going to college where he had like a, uh, just like a little local college in Flint, Michigan, where there he, he started taking like a jazz ensemble and a jazz appreciation class. And my brother and I always grew up together playing uh, music. And so I was like, um, man, can I, can I play in that ensemble? And he's like, well, got to enroll, but maybe I'll ask the teacher. And so Chuck Iwanusa, if you're watching, let me be a lackey. I didn't enroll in the class, but that's what started my jazz education right there. And uh, he turned me on to so many great records like, you know, Miles Davis Kind of Blue, which of course has like Coltrane and uh, Cannonball and Bill Evans and Jimmy Cobb, all the greats. Um, and then from there, you know, Monk and all, you know, it just kind of spirals from there, literally. And so that's what led me to Berkeley because I couldn't really crack that nut on my own. I didn't really understand what was going on with the jazz stuff. I could figure out rock, I could figure out blues, I could figure out funk, I could figure out all that other stuff. I couldn't figure out jazz on my own. And then I heard about Berkeley and then I moved to Boston and the rest is history. What about you, Dave? What yeah. was your story? I started with like classic rock bands. Like Aerosmith was my first like guitar-driven band that I really dug as a kid. Um, so shortly after, like I think it was like around like the Nine Lives record when that came out, like I got like a guitar. Like my mom got me it and started taking lessons, like learning like Walk This Way and some classic Aerosmith songs. From there, I went. I was kind of getting like heavier and heavier. So like went from like Aerosmith to Guns N' Roses, and then from Guns N' Roses to Pantera, and then they were like kind of my real 
gateway drug that like opened up like the floodgates to all these other different metal subgenres of thrash metal, death metal, black metal, you know, progressive metal, you name it. So uh, I was just kind of going down the rabbit hole, looking up. I would I would buy a CD you know, and, and look at the thanks list and find like a ton of different bands just based off that. This was back in the day when people still bought CDs and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, was, I remember getting into everything from like Cannibal Corpse to Emperor to Dark Angel, of course, like the, the classics you mentioned, like Metallica and Megadeth. Um, but yeah, I just really went down that, that underground rabbit hole. And right around the time that I was in the thick of that, uh, I was probably around 16, and I started attending Boston Arts Academy, and that's when I met Colin, and he was my teacher there. And he was my first exposure to jazz. So, you know, like I said, I was listening to all these different death metal acts, thrash metal acts, and he was like, all right, that's rad, but we're gonna learn Pat Martino, Just Friends, note for note. Okay, here we go. So uh, it was sort of like really thrown, uh, thrown head first into it, but it was good. It made me like a much better guitar player. Um, you know, I was playing in ensembles, I was learning about improvising, and the skills I learned there, I, I really carried with, with me since. Um, and then I went to Berkeley after I graduated from Boston Arts Academy, like I was saying, and studied with a, a ton of great guitar players here and just sort of further honed my craft. And, and really it's been a, an ongoing journey ever since, like with, with jazz, with really with any, I think, genre of music, like hopefully you never stop learning, right? You always are, are, are you know, striving to get to that next level. So uh, yeah, jazz has been a genre that I'm, I'm constantly working on my vocabulary, constantly trying to improve on, and I find it just sort of a, an immense well of, of creativity and uh, inspiration. I'm curious um, about your experience at Berkeley. Mine, when I was at Berkeley, like I had already kind of, um, kind of put, could, put like rock and metal to the side um, to totally immerse myself in jazz. And um, when you were here, you kind of did both. You, you, you studied with Joe Stump, you studied with John Baboian. Yep. Um, what, was, what was that like? I mean, what, what, how, did you, how did you approach kind of balancing those two in your personal practicing and, and how did those kind of like interleave? Yeah, I think I just always try to keep an open mind about it, and, I, and that's sort of the, the uh, topic of this, this clinic here is sort of the intersection of those two genres. So for me, like while I was learning jazz, like voicings and phrasing, I was always, I was never just sort of compartmentalizing it, thinking like, oh, can, I can only use this in the jazz realm. I was thinking about how can I bring this into my own metal playing, whether it was ideas from lines I was picking up or, or, or chord voicings, like how can I incorporate that? Obviously, uh, the swing rhythm is, is different from like more of like a rigid uh, militant rhythm that happens a lot in metal. Um, but I think even with this, the swing rhythm, I think that kind of crept in here and there. There's lots of kind of triplety flowing parts in Revocations uh, music that maybe might be a little bit more so than, than other metal bands. Um, but yeah, I think it's just the, the keeping an open mind was, was my biggest thing and I, I never sort of separated the two. I always like to think about how they could flow into one another. It was interesting. Um, I, re I vividly remember having Dave as a student, and we stayed in touch all these years. It's so great. We're really good friends now. Um, but even then, I mean, not much has changed other than our age, which I was pretty. I was a student at Berkeley while I was teaching at the Boston Arts Academy. So whatever like new stuff that I was working on, I would I would pass down to them. And some of the students weren't super into it, but Dave was like super hungry. And he was like, cool. But then he would show me like, oh man, this cool new chord that you showed me. And he'd be like, and I'm like, yeah, cool. And like, that's all I would say. I wouldn't be like, don't do that. Or, you know, I was just like, yeah, just cool, awesome. And then like years later, like, I see all these like people commenting online, like, man, like he uses such cool chords. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that, that was his thing. So it seemed like you were always kind of eager to just take in information, blend everything that you love together, and then just kind of it comes out as your, your songs. Yeah, I think one thing I'll add to that, I guess, like for me, if there's, if I like, I hit a roadblock with something, like, oh, I don't know how I'd like, would use this, whether it's like a chord or this or that, like, 
I just focus on it. It's almost like a challenge that I have to overcome. So I think having that in my mind like helped me to to bring in some of those voicings. It was like, oh, how am I going to use like a major seven or this or that like in like a metal context? And I was like, no, screw that. I'm definitely gonna I'm gonna dedicate myself to trying to find that sound and make it work in my particular genre of music. So it's like I don't know, like a weird puzzle like I have to try to solve. So I think that that driving force led me to some different new creative uh, outcomes. That's really cool. So. To you, what is compelling about metal and what is compelling about jazz? Well, they're both genres that require a lot of technical skill. So just from, you know, uh, f from that standpoint, I think it was always intriguing to me. Um, they're both genres that really kind of uh, go against the grain, like they're not one to follow the status quo. Um, they're, they're definitely sort of anti-establishment in, in lots of different ways. And that also drew me um, to that genre of music. And yeah, there's just sort of this like, I don't know, like esoteric magic to both those genres that uh, just keeps me coming back for more and is so compelling. That's really cool. How about if we play a tune for you? Uh, I took a, a, a John Coltrane standard uh, called Giant Steps uh, and uh, deranged it a little bit instead of arranged it. So we're gonna um, we're gonna mess with it a little bit. We're gonna add some interesting harmonies to it. We're gonna change the time signature a bit, um, and we're just gonna have some fun. And so um, we will be doing Q and A at the end of of this whole clinic there. So if you have some questions, you know, make a note of them, um, and uh, definitely uh, we'd love to to hear what what you uh, what you're thinking. So we have two mics set up over here. We'll we'll run that at the end. So just keep those questions in mind.
It's like a meditation exercise. Has anybody here played Giant Steps before? <laughs> Three and a half. I saw one guy go, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. If it's not a yes, I guess it's a no. I don't know. You try, yeah. Well, that's, that's the first step, first attempt in learning, right? Fail. It's hard. Yeah. I made it harder. <laughs> Dave, Dave emailed me back. He's like, man, you're still kicking my beep after all these years. Um, let me just break a little bit of that down for us. Um, I think anything can be really intimidating if we view it as a complex um, problem. I think the more we simplify, um, the easier the problem gets to, um, to solve. So a couple, couple points of view on this um, that I wanted to draw your attention to. So um, first off, there are really only three keys in this song. Now, you might say only three. Well, most songs have one. Um, <laughs> but Giant Steps has three keys, and they're all major keys. There's actually not that much crazy harmony going on. Um, going back to the changes here, it's just a whole lot of two, five, one in three keys. Those keys are starts in B major, then it immediately shifts to G major, then it, it shifts right after that to E flat major. And those are the three keys. What makes it awkward is that it, he doesn't change um, always on beat one where we expect it to change. It changes on beat three. So he puts the five chord on halfway through the measure. And that's really awkward at first. It's, it's weird to feel like we're in one key and then before we're landing on the next part, we're already in a new key. So that's, that's just something you got to get kind of used to. Um, but I feel like one of the, the essential steps in cracking the code of giant steps is knowing the order of the keys. So I put a little box at the bottom here. Those are your three keys, B, G, E, flat. Now, whatever way you can memorize this, I put it into like three tiers, right? The second line looks like a permutation or an inversion of the first. So it looks like a first inversion augmented chord, if you would. So if you look at that as a B augmented chord, B, D sharp, and G but spread out so it's B, G, D sharp, and then N harmonically spell it as E flat, boom, you've got your first three keys. And then you put it in first inversion, and then the last one is just starting on E flat, and then going in a different voicing, E flat, G, B to E flat, and then it repeats. That's the whole tune. So if you can memorize that, I feel like, you'll have a little bit more of a shot of uh, landing the changes in that tune. So um, you have, did everybody get a handout or did we run out? We ran out, yeah. Um, well, that's okay. You can make friends and you know, you can s Snapchat each other the, the packet. Um, but yeah, you can, you can uh, simply, follow this for those key changes. I mean, you don't really need that little box. It's all right here, right? So if you want to tackle giant steps, try that out first. Dave, you're, yes. playing, you're playing some really nice chords. It was nice to play over those chords. Um, let's talk about them. Let's talk about those chords. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, using drop twos, drop threes. Are, are people familiar with drop twos and drop threes out there? Show of hands. Okay. Yep. Oh, there we go. Well, if you're not, <laughs> there they are right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's like your, your, your core jazz voicings right there. And then you can obviously alter them, add tensions, um, you know, move the voicings around a little bit. Uh, so for me, I really dove into chords and jazz harmony, uh, as I was saying with, with Colin for the first time, and, and he really kind of opened my eyes up to just harmony in general and, and, and how you can kind of approach playing these voicings on the guitar and then how, how you can sort of alter these voicings um, 
you know, add tensions in, like I was saying. So I guess this kind of pivots to, to the next part of the, the discussion here, um, which is how I use this stuff in, in the metal context, right? So I'm just going to switch guitars here. Now it's getting real. So Dave's signature guitar is a warrior. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Good job, Jackson. Uh, we did bring in some special guitars for you today. Uh, Dave lives in New York. He brought up all of his gear, uh, which is really cool. Um, we are playing on vintage ES-335s. His is from 69. Mine's a uh, battle-worn 66. Um, and then we have our own kind of signature models that were made for us. This is a Klein headless six string with uh, DiMarzio pickups. These are the Dave Davidson signature DiMarzios in there, which Dave was so generous in uh, gifting me. And then of course those same pickups are in his seven string. Uh, so yeah, and that's his uh, signature uh, Jackson Warrior. Yeah. Um, so. As, as so we're, we're going to play an example um, from a tune called Communion uh, that's on our album Great Is Our Sin. Uh, and it's, it's utilizing some of these jazz voicings, so I, I figured I'd just kind of play through them first and talk about how I use them in more of like a, a metal context. So without any of the distortion or high gain or anything like that, um, th these are the voicings sort of broken down for you guys. So the first voicing is just like a regular you know, E minor uh, triad, right? Everyone knows that chord probably. The next voicing okay, is this F7 flat 9, which is you know, commonly used in jazz. You don't see that chord a lot in metal. You might see the natural 9, you know, in like a funk or like, you know, rock setting. Um, but using it with that flat 9, it's kind of more of a jazz voicing, right? And then B flat major 7, that's just like a regular drop 3 voicing. Right, classic, uh, you know, meat and potatoes voicing, and then back to an A minor triad, and then the second ending of that, back to the E minor, with the F7 flat nine, then going to a B7 altered. You can think about it like a flat 13, right? Tension tone, or like a B7, you know, augmented fifth. However you want to think about it, that's sort of the cool thing about learning jazz harmonies. There's, there's different ways to, to think about stuff, but I guess I'm thinking about that like a flat 13. So this would be like a regular B7 chord. Right? And this is with the flat 13 voicing. Again, a really nice uh, chord that you hear commonly in, in jazz. Um, and one thing I want to say, I'll, I'll add to this, is it's not just about the voicings, it's, it's about voice leading, right? So when you're thinking about comping for someone, uh, I'm trying to think about sort of like a, almost like a counter melody to the solo that he's playing that I can kind of fill in a supporting role, especially when you're just playing uh, duo or whatever. Um, but you know, somehow like trying to find different connective tissue between these voicings, right? So uh, with communion, um, if I play the chords just sort of back to back, bass motion is kind of weird, right? It's very sort of metal sounding. It has this. Right, some half steps and, and, and the motion is maybe more, bass motion is more uh, indicative of like a like heavy metal or whatever. But the, the, the top line is all chromatic. So that was an exercise I used to do, uh, you know, in, in a variety of different classes was basically like, you know, taking a melody line, it could be chromatic, it could be diatonic, but like essentially just sort of harmonizing that line. I think it's, it's cool to take a chromatic line when you normally don't associate that as being sort of super melodic, and because of the chords that you're putting underneath, it kind of brings that melody uh, to life in a, in a different way. It's a very jazz piano type of approach to mm -hmm. try to kind of thread a line that right. is very closely connected uh, from chord to chord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's yeah. kind of not a, not a rock thing. No, yeah, I mean, you know, just even doing like a two five one, like it's let's say we were in the key of you know B flat major, right? If I had like C minor seven, you know, F seven, right? 
B flat major seven, that line on top. It's going down chromatically. You could go the other way too. Right, and go up and add a tension on the major chord. So anyway, you know, studying jazz, studying chord melodies, um, that definitely crept into my my musical mind somewhere along the line because it's starting to come out in my metal playing, so maybe we should play it. says jazz voicings can't be death metal, right? All right, so that's that. Um, <laughs> so that's that. Um, next song, uh, should we move, move on to the next song? Anyone have any questions about that or no? Okay, good. Questions at the end. Okay, right, we're doing questions at the end, okay. So uh, next tune uh, is off our latest record, Outer Ones. It's a song called Fathomless Catacombs. All right, yeah, we got a... Fathomless Catacombs fan. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, let's see, I'll, I'll go back to the clean, maybe. Okay. So this one, um, I picked up these voicings from like a Wayne Shorter tune, but I'm obviously not playing it in the same um, way that he is. But uh, it's this really cool jazz harmony. It's, a, it's like an F sharp seven sus. <laughs> Less commonly used voicings. It's still a still a drop two, but maybe one that you don't see as often. There it is. Yeah. Then we got. Okay, so that's like an F bass note. Where it's really kind of like an inversion of like D flat, but that F bass note, and the bass is playing the low F, so it's creating this chromatic motion down to E sus. So very kind of like proggy, like some non-functional jazz harmony, right? Like learning jazz, you know, you learn your classic standards. There's lots of two, five, one motion. Um, you know, you get those under your belt and then you start to explore other composers that, uh, you know, wanted to push the boundaries of, of jazz harmony and we're using lots of like non-functional, non-diatonic chords. So, you know, we have F sharp, sus, this like D flat major inversion with F in the bass and then, Sus. So very nice. And again with some voice leading, you know, like the, the top voices, you know. What's cool about that is that uh, that major seven and first inversion, you can see it in the uh, second row, second, uh, third column there. Um, a lot of times that's used as like an upward motion so like we would kind of hear that maybe from like like moving the chord progression up right so that first inversion major chord is kind of like that's the common use of it in in music and what's cool about this chord progression is that it's actually kind of moving it in the opposite direction it's moving from f sharp sus and then f to E, so the chromatic motion is in the bass. So that's kind of a, a, a flip on that, which is pretty unusual and it sounds really cool. Yeah, and that, and that chromatic sort of bass motion is very metal sounding, so that's why I like to do it.
thanks, guys. I was liking that. I like that a lot. Just wanted to keep going. Yep. Uh, and then finally, uh, another song off our latest record. Uh, this one's called Vanitas. And uh, this one, I guess, is kind of unique because the, the riff before, like, the chord progression sort of came first for me. Um, with this song, the, the riff came first. And so I was able to sort of, using my knowledge of jazz theory, jazz harmony, I, I took the the riff and, and made chords of it. I knew I wanted it to go into a solo um, after you know this, this section goes by, but I didn't want to solo over the riff because it's like a little bit busy and it's sort of its own thing. So I wanted to make it into a, a chord progression. So I just sort of analyzed it like I would any kind of chord melody and uh, and, and and put uh, chords to the to the melody notes. Um, so maybe we should just play this one. that one. Yeah, so the chords there, I'm just going to break them down really quick. So the, the riff that I was playing there has like this kind of like E minor sound, so uh, I harmonize that. It looks like an E minor triad. Then moving to an E minor major 7 voice thing, which is kind of very mysterious and cool for metal. Then to a C7-9 voice thing. This voice thing you'd normally see like there, like when you're playing um, you know, jazz or, or funk because it's uh, on those strings, it's a little bit maybe brighter, uh, whereas there it's a bit maybe darker sounding, but with high gain, using it in the metal context, uh, you know, you can get away with it. So even just like where you're playing these chords on the neck might change depending on the genre of music that you're playing. Uh, and then, just like an A7 uh, voice and where I'm doubling up on the third. And the voice leading uh, comes back again. Instead of being in the top voice, the melody note, the voice leading is happening in one of the middle voices here. So like it's another chromatic line. It's over to the to the top voice for the uh, last two voicings there. So kind of a cool way to disguise another chromatic line uh, using some some different voicings and the, and the bass motion, right? Which again has maybe like a little bit of like more of a darker sound to it. And then the last chord, just as like a final tag, a final turnaround, uh, it just goes to an F sharp seven. So that kind of pivots you into a different. Um, key there, which is obviously something that happens in jazz constantly, throwing in different endings where it changes keys, you know, the, the, the A section has a, you know, first ending and a second ending, and the second ending maybe is moving you to a bridge section where it's a new key, in this instance it moves to the uh, beginning, uh, the intro riff, which is in B, sounds like this. <laughs> so like my knowledge of jazz theory, and you know, this goes back to classical music, but like a, a five chord, right? So that F sharp seven is gonna bring you to B minor. So Collins, 
great educator and also an amazing performer. Um, what's something that you've learned from being an educator and something you've learned from being a performer? And do you see any sort of crossover between those two, uh, or do you keep them kind of like separate and compartmentalized? Yeah, what's interesting is that um, because I've been teaching for so long that they're kind of, um, like I learn a lot in real time and I'm able to share that. So that's, that's one really interesting thing is that I feel like I would, like when I was teaching at the Boston Arts Academy, for instance, I had a, like a five or six night a week uh, gig. And so I would literally spend all night playing and then like Boston public schools start really early. So I had like, I had to be at the Boston Arts Academy, I think at like 7.15 in the morning <laughs> after gigging, you know, getting home at, at like 1.30 and then having to shower because you're all gross and nasty and stuff. And, and literally like there's, there's, there's no in, in, in your life, I mean you sleep, but that's not like a real strong buffer. So you, your consciousness is going right from the gig basically right to the classroom. So I feel like um, there's a lot of things that, especially with music students, like you can be r pretty real with them, you know? Like the things that we talk about, especially at Berkeley, we, we talk about like exactly the, the realities of being a musician and, and what we deal with. Um, and we use examples from 10 hours ago, not, 40 years ago or, you know, 200 years ago. But literally what we were going through on the gig. Um, that, that's some real-time feedback for you. Uh, the faculty here is incredible, and they were doing the same thing for me when I was a student. It was this really weird thing to be like going to, to Berkeley as a, as a student and learning stuff and then disseminating that information to the next up and comers and then playing with really great musicians on the gig, like some, some people who are like totally taking me to school in a, in a different way, you know, like playing with Kurt Elling. Like, I think that's, that's probably my biggest takeaway from the performance aspect is that with all of like these really like huge names that are out there that I've, some of which I've played with, they have an extra gear that they can go in when they step on stage. Like rehearsal's one thing, but when you get on stage with them, they leave you in the dust. You, th you, you think you're driving with them. You think you're on the race course with them. You're like, yeah, I can hang with this. And then all of a sudden they do that. And it's like, ooh. So that was something that I, I noticed with every single great performer, including yourself too. You have, a, you have an extra gear and, and, you, and I can see that in some students. I, I, I really value that. I think that's something that uh, can be learned. I think it can be practiced. So work on your, your overdrive gear. You guys wanna hear another tune? You're such a great audience, thank you. You're so respectful and kind and lovely. Um, we're gonna play a um, kind of a funk fusion tune by Freddie Hubbard. So we're kind of marry these two worlds uh, of like jazz and rock a little bit uh, by kind of doing a little crossover thing here. So it's kind of a little funky tune that will uh, I'm getting a little crazy on here. Sound together. This song, this song's called Tovo.
Dave Davidson, Colin Sapp, uh, you're so sweet. Um, one, one final question before we open up uh, to questions from you guys. Um, I'm curious to know, Dave, <clears throat> uh, from your perspective, uh, what are the most, what are like the three most valuable guitar skills that an aspiring student should work on that that aren't commonly addressed in a music school. Um, well, I think just being like a versatile player is huge, right? So even if something isn't necessarily your your genre of choice, try to keep an open mind to that because, like I was saying, that's the sort of point of this whole clinic is you never know where you're going to find uh, inspiration. So keeping an open mind to that, um, transcribing things, I think is really important because it works on your your ear. Um, you know, people want to come up with, you know, different ideas on their own, but, you know, I, I feel like you're always sort of standing on the shoulders of giants, right? There's, there's so much great, uh, you know, music out there from those that have come before us. So uh, to sort of tap into that and, and learn that, and you never know how that's going to affect your style. So definitely transcribing um, is really important. And I think just trying to find, you know, your own voice, right? Like, don't try to follow any particular trend because it's something that everyone else is doing. It's something that's like cool to do, right? Like really try to make music that comes from the heart and, and um, you know, try to seek out that vision uh, however you can. That's, those are great points. I tried to say those, those same things. I mean, in, in music school, it's so easy to get wrapped up in, in playing the right rhythms and the right pitches. And, Really what it comes down to is, is, is that's, that's definitely important. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you got to play good notes. You've got to play it in time. you got to make sure that. But if, if it's kind of lacking in the right essence, you know, like the right vibe, the right uh, attitude, the right emotional content, then it's all kind of flat. You know, it doesn't really sit well. So always filter that through, you know, like, like I feel like there's like three, three things that we're always working on as guitar players. And if you, you can get all of those to line up, then, then that's, uh, that, that's really the ideal. So the three things would be like your mind. So that's where you know that you're supposed to be playing a certain pitch on a certain chord, let's say. Uh, and then your heart, it's got to filter through that. Like, does this feel genuine? Is this authentic? Am I adding enough emotional content to it? And then execution with your fingers, so the physicality of it. Those three things in, um, in unison are what we're struggling to all maintain or attain. And um, those are the things that, uh, we, that I constantly practice all the time. Any final thoughts from... Your corner over there. Is that a corner? No. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, thank you guys so much for being such a great uh, audience, and I think maybe we can open up to, to questions. I thank you to Colin for, for having me and to Berkeley oh. in general. This was uh, it's really, really cool to come back to my old alma mater and yeah. uh, actually do some teaching here. So it's a real, real honor for me. So thank you very much to everyone at Berkeley that made this happen and to Colin for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for being here, buddy. We've got a question over here. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, question is about creating tone. You two both have fabulous tone. If you use maybe Povo as an example, we can't see the pedals you have. But, yeah. Uh, most important thoughts you have on how you create your tone or what pedals you're using to do that. Thank you. Sure. Well, you know, my, my most important pedal is my, my signature uh, <laughs> Donable pedal that's coming out soon. That's the Donable Eidolon. Um, I mean, it, I think you got to find what works for you. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of like different companies, so I've got like um, some Strymon pedals up here. I think they make a great reverb pedal. I'm using the Strymon Flint, I'm using the Strymon Sunset. Uh, I think it's like anything. There's certain brands that you just kind of associate with a certain uh, quality. So you know, do, do some exploring for yourself and, and, and find what works for you that makes it easiest for your for your sound to come up. But yeah, the Dunable Idolon definitely go buy that. Yeah, buy two of those. Uh, for me. Um, I have a, a wide, I have a lot of gear, and um, I don't recommend going down that route um, unless you, you uh, 
don't ever want to have a significant other in your life. Um, but uh, <laughs> I feel like certain gear responds well with each other and, and then like your own personal touch, you know, the way you handle an instrument, there's a lot of tone that comes from that. So it's, it's not just gear that the tone comes from, it is a lot of, of, like, if I plugged in Dave's rig, I would still sound like me. And if he, he put in his stuff into my rig, it, it would sound like him. Um, so, like, that's kind of just an extension. And so, like, some people's rigs sound so good when they play it, and then I play it, and I'm like, that is not me. So it might not be the, the, the most ideal thing to, to kind of, like, say, like, oh, this piece of gear is, like, the best or whatever. But it certainly works, works for us. I mean, like, you know, I'll, I'll plug Friedman again. I mean, they make incredible gear, I think. Like, I think this amp, it's a brand new model, the JJ Junior, it's pretty epic. It's a two channel EL84. It's got crunch and clean, which I have, you've heard both of those today. And I'm also using their BEOD Deluxe pedal. And I, I feel like, even with like, I'm not bringing my own amp, um, the BEOD Deluxe is kind of like a really good crunchy uh, sound that, that gets me where I need to be on, on many different amps, but again, that works for my setup and not necessarily like you, you you might play through it and be like yeah the Colin Saf is which is true but I mean I'm, talk, I'm talking about the gear cool. uh, let's go over here hey I have a question for Dave uh, so I went to this show a while back and it was uh, intervals with um, Jason Richardson and Nick Johnston mm -hmm. and at the end of the show they did this huge jam with everybody uh, and then you came out on stage, mm -hmm. and it was amazing. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, it was awesome. But uh, I, everybody on stage was, you know, doing this really technical, shreddy stuff. But you were also adding in a lot of these really interesting, um, jazzy ideas into your soloing. And I know you've talked a lot today about, you know, using jazz chords and jazz ideas to make riffs in metal. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sort of um, using ideas from jazz in soloing in a metal context? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, like cer certain phrases, I think just how jazz musicians view chord changes in general is super inspiring to me, right? They're not sort of sticking to just like like a three note per string sort of scale shape um, with, with guitar players, right? I mean, uh, and, and if you talk to any sort of guitar player that's in the jazz realm that's like really dedicated, like probably their, their biggest influences aren't going to be other guitar players. They're gonna be like piano players or saxophone players and stuff like that. So um, just learn, like learning the lines that like, like when I'm working on like a, you know, a Coltrane transcription or uh, you know, something from like any number of, of, of great horn players out there, like the lines that they're crafting, right? Like they weren't meant to be uh, played on guitar. And of course you can play them on guitar, but it leads you down all these different um, pathways. So rather than say like a specific concept, like, oh, if you connect the, the major second to the root by, you know, a chromatic note and then going and go into a major arpeggio or whatever, it's gonna sound hip. Like, you know, I think just like, like what I was saying earlier with like listening, um, listening and transcribing or, or, or seeking out other transcriptions, like you'll find so many great answers there uh, and so many great ideas. And I, I, I will say like it's all in sort of how you, you analyze it, right? So if you, if you look at um, a transcription, try to dive deep into it. Try not to just look at it like, like tablature on the fretboard, but try to think about, okay, what is this chord that they're playing over and what is the line that they're doing here and, like, and how are they arriving at certain uh, points of tension and resolution within that line. So, you know, are they substituting, uh, you know, a different type of arpeggio uh, from a different degree of the scale over a particular chord? Are they, you know, you know, altering it in some way using like an altered scale um, or some, you know, triadic substitution? Or is it just like a cool chromatic line and, and, the, and the rhythm is just lining up in a way where like all of the sort of out notes are on upbeats and all of the really strong chord tones are on downbeats? I mean, that was like a huge resolution for me of like, oh, like, you know, why is it when I play a chromatic line, it just doesn't, doesn't sound as hip as when like someone like, you know, Pat Metheny plays a chromatic line or whatever. It's because like, there's there's a, a nuance to the rhythm there. Um, and I, I was actually working with a student recently um, 
about this, where they were sort of the, the the line came in on uh, you know the the uh, the one e so it was on the e of the of a sixteenth note, right? But they were they were counting themselves in on the downbeat, right? And that's just one sixteenth note. But you know if if you're not coming in in the right place everything on that line is going to actually kind of sound like backwards because all of the arrival points are going to be reversed. So just like really thinking about rhythm in, in, in that kind of way. But yeah, I think, um, I mean, because I could talk for, for hours about different like techniques and stuff like that, but just, you know, transcribe or, or work on transcriptions and, and, and really kind of analyze them. I think that would be a huge, huge help. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I come from a kind of similar background, like I started on metal and rock and then moved more towards like jazz and soul music and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as to like exactly how you made that step forward and what you focused on at first, like what bridged the gap for you? Because I think like for me, it's um, not really the playing and the chops, but it's the conceptual application of the ideas to metal or jazz are the biggest hurdle to get over. Mm -hmm. So how exactly did you get over that hurdle? Um, I think for, for me it was it was just kind of like keeping like like a creative mindset the whole way. So so like I was sort of mentioning earlier, not looking at jazz voicings as only in, in the jazz realm, but like really kind of getting in there and exploring it, finding like voicings that really resonated with me um, sort of across the board and then figuring out like rhythmically how to make them work or uh, you know con, you know, Creatively, um, yeah, just the creativity I think is 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 really the key. Like if if you're looking at it like homework, right? You're never gonna, I think, be able to utilize it in a way that's coming from the from the heart. Whereas if you look at something like, oh wow, I've got this whole new color palette to to work with. Um, you know, how can I how can I utilize that? And let my own voice come through. Like let the heart come through. Like like Colin was talking about earlier. And I, I feel like a immersion into those styles is, is kind of a, a prerequisite. Um, uh, I, I, I had to really, so I had a, a really good friend, uh, he lives in Brooklyn now too actually, uh, Stefan, Stefan Remble, great gypsy jazz guitar player, grew up in Django's hometown, um, and he was a student here at the same time as I was. And I, of course I loved gypsy jazz, but I had never played it, you know, I was kind of more of like a, a straight ahead jazz guy when I was here and then towards the end I went more into the fusion thing and then um, he was really like man I, I want to learn how you do that like fusion stuff you know and I was like man I want to learn how you do that gypsy jazz stuff and he told me you should really if you want to do it just dedicate the next two years of your life to only doing that and that made sense to me I was like okay yeah that's that's how you get good at that thing um, you have to put all your energy into it. That doesn't mean dismiss anything, right? But to really master something, you got to go, you got to do a deep dive on it. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, hi. So you do a lot of, um, like, you take a lot of techniques from jazz and use them in metal. And one of the things I always found most interesting about both genres is how they use rhythm and how both of those connect that much in that way. And I'm interested in knowing, in writing your music in Revocation, do you use like odd time signatures and prog rhythms? And if so, what is your approach to prog rhythms and odd time signatures? Yeah, um, with, with Vanitas, uh, that's, that's in five, right? So soloing five is, uh, is definitely, Tricky if you're not used to doing that. Um, I mean, as far as like my my approach to it, I think I think some of that stuff just comes out naturally. So like when I wrote that riff, it, you know, I wasn't thinking necessarily about like a time signature or this or that. Like, you know, they they taught me at Berkeley here. It's like all right, you, you, we taught you all this stuff now. Like, forget about it and just like go like make music, right? So I think you, know, you work on. There's a difference between you know uh, you know practicing and and turning that creative part of your brain on. But I think the more you practice and the more you focus on something, it can come out sort of naturally. So to be honest with you, sometimes those ideas, like I don't know like where they're coming from. Like I, when I wrote the Vanitas riff, I wasn't thinking about, okay, I'm going to write a riff in 5-4 right now. It just sort of like came out. Um, I've certainly like worked, you know, with the metronome and with different like looping uh, 
apps or whatever on like you know odd time meter. I've I've worked on learning other people's music that's in odd times, and, and you know, and I enjoy listening to a lot of music that's in, you know proggy and fusiony in, in odd time meters. So I think the combination of uh, practice, the immersion that Colin was talking about, whether it's listening or like focusing on it intently in the in the practice room, that's how those ideas are going to like um, come out naturally. I'm not like sitting down with like a like a pen and paper and, and like writing things out when I write music, it all kind of comes from, at least with replication, like it all sort of just comes out sort of naturally through the guitar. And then, and then I kind of go back after the fact and say, oh, this is in five, oh, that's cool. Or like, oh, this is in seven, or, or oh, this is like kind of a combination of like some like polymeter stuff where like it's, it's, it's pivoting back and forth between four and three or, you know, and it adds up to, you know, whatever number it adds up to. But, I, I kind of just let the, the music sort of come out first, but I think, I think that's a product of listening to a lot of different genres of music. Um, classical music, right? There's tons of shifting meter with that. Um, yeah, I think it just kind of comes out in like a, a natural way. Yeah, you get to a certain point where when you start to compose that you, um, you, you don't have a specific agenda. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is, is that you're, you're just trying to express an idea, whatever idea is in you. And, and then, it, and, and I think it comes out in a much more organic way that way. Because if you, if you sit, sit down with a pen and paper like Dave was saying, you know, and like you said, oh, I'm, I'm going to write something in 13, 16, it's going to sound like a math equation. It's not going to sound like music. So, but if you've done a lot of shedding um, in 13, 16, and you think in 1316, and you're fluent in 1316, then ideas in 1316 start to emerge, and they sound cool, they sound musical, because they came from here, not from like, oh, that was not the right thing, you know what I mean? So it's, I think you have to do all of the groundwork that Dave was saying to get to the organic place that he's at to create. And, and just to build on that, like quickly, like we open with giant steps, that's not traditionally in seven, at all, it's it's in it's in four four. So, and it's it's hard enough soloing over in four four. So, like to to get it in seven minutes, I had to listen to it over and over again. I had to practice with like loops and stuff like that to like feel that, you know, ba do da uh, uh, like and it's really like. So when I was playing it, I wasn't counting one two three four one two three one two three four one two three. You know, I wasn't doing that because that's how you're gonna get like totally lost. But I was like feeling that rhythm internally. So like. You know, when you, whether you're writing music or going on a gig, like if you have to like count something, it's it's gonna sound like stiff. So like when I, when I'm playing Vanitas, I'm not hearing that as one two three four five one two three four five. I'm just hearing that melody of the riff and feeling that that groove. Um, and I think hopefully that's how it sounds, sort of natural and organic. Whether it's a solo or a melody or just like a riff, standalone riff, yeah, f like feeling it deep down inside rather than something that's like this external thing you have to like think about and count. But yeah, great question. Thank you. All right, this one's for David. When did you figure out that you could sing and play guitar at the same time or scream for that matter? And like, how do you go about when it comes to writing music? Do you write music that you find will be easier to sing and play at the same time? Or do you write the music first and then find words for it or like, how do you go about writing your music when it comes to singing at the same time? Because your riffs are really hard to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was just born sort of from necessity. You know, like when you're into like underground genres of music, it's not like a huge like deep bench that you can really pull from, you know, like in, you know, wherever you're from. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in like a pretty big, I mean, I grew up in Boston, so it's a big city. So there, there was a good scene here, but you know, like whatever high school you're in, the grade you're in, there's, you're not gonna have like hundreds of people that are just chomping at the bit to being like, to be in like an underground death metal band, right? Um, or, or if they are, maybe they don't have like the dedication or the, the, the talent to do it like at that stage of the game. So uh, for me, it was just like, we didn't really have <laughs> any other options and I just started like picking it up and, and, and playing along. Um, I, I think the, the passion that was there helped. I mean, I was really, I mean, just as much as I was into metal guitar players, then I was also totally enamored with with metal vocalists and like you know singing along like in my room to like songs and stuff like that. It just it just kind of gave me this like energizing feeling, and then obviously being on stage and and, and letting that come out. Um, I'm a pretty like soft spoken guy, I feel like, but like I get to really kind of let the demons out uh, in that regard. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, 
yeah, it was just like a, just a dedication to it and I was just like just going to make it work. Now as far as like composing goes, like I'm, I'm like constantly like kicking myself because I don't like write a vocal pattern and then like a, a, a riff around that. Like I, it could always starts with the riff and with the song for me and then I sort of let the song inform the lyrics and the vocal patterns. So very rarely am I sitting down with a guitar making sure that I can play and sing this stuff before I go into the studio. I kind of do them separately. I'm like, oh, this is a cool vocal hook right now. Or like, oh, this sounds like super mean. Like, I got to like deliver it with this like kind of swagger because I don't want the I don't want the riff and the vocals to kind of like line up where if I'm playing something chunky, I have to like sing along to the exact rhythm or else I fall off. Like I like to have counter rhythms yeah. happening because some of my favorite bands had vocalists that were sort of stand alone from the guitar player and like I said it just kind of there's a certain swagger to certain lines like how you deliver them uh, and I don't want it to sound like the, the two have to be like uh, inextricably tied or else I'm gonna like fall off so there's many times where I'm like okay that's sick how the hell am I gonna sing and play that <laughs> live yeah. and it's just like repetition playing it slowly I mean sometimes with that I'll kind of like count it out like okay this part of the vocal melodies like coming in on the upbeat here on the downbeat and just kind of work on it slowly but there are times thankfully like on certain really hard parts like just in my in my composing style I like to have um, you know variety in, in guitar parts sometimes it's cool to have the guitars syncing up and playing the same thing or you know they're playing a harmony together um, but other times like I like to you know hold open like a big chord and then there's some cool arpeggio happening so if it's something like that like there's a solo uh, there's a chorus of a song called a dead ode to the grave and it's very involved with this arpeggio and i'm just holding out power chords and make dan do that the hard stuff i can just <laughs> belt it out there so yeah. sometimes you get lucky and you can kind of have two guitar parts and there's one part that's like a little bit simpler or like or at least for the purposes of singing over um and i can take that but there's other times where i just have to suck it up and make it happen sweet thank you thank you we got time for one more question um, I think this is a challenge that every guitarist and by extension every musician has to like overcome in their own way but I wanted to know if either of you had advice on converting like the general generic material that you would learn into music and by extension using what you learn to bolster what you hear and what you could play on the instrument. So by generic material, you mean like, like learning like a scale material, or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I keep coming back to the, the creative component, but like, you know, not just looking at a scale as, you know, I have to kind of ascend and descend from the root, like looking at it like a melody and there's so many different notes, like just, I mean, really quickly, if we just take like a major scale, right? You know, if I take a, a G major scale. Right? I mean, you could look at that like in so many, you know, separate it like that. You could take like chord, like a lot of people might harmonize that scale, you know, with just like kind of basic chords like that. But you don't, you don't have, no, there's no rule that says you have to harmonize a scale like that. What if I took the, like an interval combination, like the, uh, here's the root. So if I do a second and then up from there a fourth, and then I harmonize the scale like that. I mean, I mean, this chord right. That's super. That's metal sounding. I don't know. Like, I would use that and like somehow, right? And then you think about all the different bass notes from that scale. So like this over, you know, if I take E for example, which is the sixth of G, right? That was the root before. Now it's over E. I could use that for a riff or something like that. I don't know. So, so what he's really talking about is how creative can you be? So we all get the same information. We all have the same 12 notes. We all have the same limitations of our instrument. So you just saw a really awesome insight as to how David Davidson thinks about being creative. And so anything that you can do to be creative with it, like I was going to say the same exact thing. I'm like, hey, look at G major, but only in harmonics. Right, those are all in G major. 
I've done the work where I know where all the notes of G major are on my instrument, so now it's like a playground for me. It's like going to the beach. There's not really any rules. I mean, you can't maybe like hurt other people and like, you know, like hurt the wildlife. But other than that, like, it's just like, have fun. Like, you know, Hal Crook, one of my favorite teachers here, uh, he, he says, you know, just splash water on each other, throw the Frisbee, uh, you know, run around, play. That's what this is. This is our sandbox and we can do whatever we want with it. And it's up to you to see how much fun you can have with it. Um, I have an exercise called the flow exercise, if the sound is still on here. There's my metronome. So I'll just see if I can explore the entire range of my guitar in G major. see what kind of crazy stuff I can come up with. And that kind of just, it, it like helps me when it's time to actually improvise. When somebody says, hey man, take a solo in G. I'm like, oh baby, you better watch out. So yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You got it, buddy. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. You guys are real, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Have a fantastic guitar week. Uh, I hope to see a lot of you guys on the street. Take care.